Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to call to order the uh, 329th meeting of the City of Laurel Board of Appeals. I apologize for making anybody wait a few minutes. I'm usually not late, but forgive me. Uh, item number one on the agenda, because we do have quite a few people in the audience, let's get started, is uh, roll call. Ms. Parker. Present. Mrs. Collins. Here. Mr. Whitley. Present. Mrs. Les. Here. Mr. Lee. Present. Chairwoman Chenault. Here. You have a quorum, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, item number two of our agenda is the approval of the minutes from the meeting of February 26. Do I have any corrections that need to be made or addressed, or may I have a motion to approve? Madam Chairwoman, I'll make a motion that we approve the minutes as read. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Approved. Yes. Mr. Whitley? I vote yes. Mrs. Collins? Yes. Mrs. Les? I vote yes. Chairwoman Chenault? Yes. Motion carries. I was just going to say that you couldn't vote, but we did. You were on the phone. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he was homesick and he made him uh, listen to us on the phone to uh, go ahead and go through with the, uh, the application. So thank you again for that. My pleasure. Okay, good. <clears throat> okay, let's go here. Um, item number three, special exception application number 841, Wawa Gas Station Complex, Laurel <coughs> Plaza Shopping Center, Fort Meade Road, filed by Kimco Laurel, Inc. May I have a reading of the record, please? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Special exception application number 841 was filed on December 9th, 2014 by Kimco Laurel, Inc., <coughs> requesting approval to construct a Wawa gas station complex, including a convenience store with associated parking to be located on the northeast corner of Maryland Route 198, Fort Meade Road, and Maryland Route 197, Laurel Bowie Road. The property is zoned CG Commercial General. On February the 13th, 2015, a notice of the filing of the application was sent to all contiguous property owners. All return receipts were received with the exception of Robert Chance of 835A Baltimore, Annapolis Boulevard, Pasadena, Maryland. And Boozer Base, also a Boozer Bayside Hotel, Inc., 12417 Ocean Gate, Gateway Suite 28C, Ocean City, Maryland, 21842. In Kimco, Maryland, Inc., 3333 New Hyde Park Road, Suite 100, New Hyde Park, New York, 11042. On December the 9th, 2014, a request asking for comments was sent to the City of Laurel Department of Public Works, Department of Parks and Recreation, Laurel Police Department, and the Office of the Fire Marshal, Laurel Volunteer Fire Department, Laurel Volunteer Rescue Squad, Responses were received from the following departments and have been made part of the official record. Laurel Office of the Fire Marshal, December 9, 2014. Laurel Volunteer Rescue Squad, December 13, 2014. Laurel Police Department, December 15, 2014. Laurel Department of Park and Recreation, December 16, 2014. And Laurel Department of Public Works, December the 22nd, 2014. On December 17, 2014, the plans, application, and cover letter were sent to Maryland State Highway Administration, Prince George's County Health Department, Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation, Washington Suburban Sanitation Commission, Maryland Department of Planning, and Prince George's County Public School, requesting comments on the application. On December the 22nd, 2014, a request was received from the Maryland State Highway Administration stating that the administration could not provide comments until the application submitted a traffic, until the applicant submitted a traffic impact analysis. On January the 2nd, 2015, the Prince George's County Health Department submitted a <coughs> response stating that the, that the applicant must contact the department for an inspection prior to demolition of the current building and submit building permit plans for the new food store facility, convenience store. On January 9, 2015, the Washington Suburban Sanitation Commission submitted a response 
that has been made a part of the official record. The applicant submitted a traffic impact analysis dated February 9, 2015, prepared by Wells and Associate Transportation Consultants. The analysis was immediately sent to the Maryland State Highway Administration and the City of Laurel Department of Public Works for review and comment. <clears throat> On February 19th, the City of Laurel Transportation and Public Safety Committee reviewed the application. The committee comments have been made a part of the record. On February 26, 2015, the City of Laurel Department of Public Works submitted comments that have been made part of the official record. On March 19, 2015, the Maryland State Highway Administration submitted comments that have been made part of the official record. Madam Chair, at this time, I request that the Maryland State Highway Administration comments be adopted as part of this technical staff report. The file contains a certificate of publication verifying that this application and public hearing was advertised as required by law in the March 12, 2015 edition of the Prince George's Sentinel. A memorandum from the City of Laurel Planning Commission to the Board of Appeals dated March 11, 2015 reads as follows. At the regular meeting of the City of Laurel Planning Commission held on March 10, 2015, the following action was taken on the subject zoning application. A motion by Mrs. Bettman, seconded by Mr. Kish, carried on a roll call vote by all members present, the Planning Commission recommended that the City of Laurel Board of Appeals grant special exception application number 841 with the conditions as presented in the technical staff report. That concludes the reading of the file, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Do you think since we just recently got this highway report in and no one really has seen it or, or probably read it, do you think we should read it into the record or do you think it's fine the way it is? Uh, <coughs> We can probably read it into the record. Their since, conditions. since it arrived after the fact, I think we probably should. Okay. Uh, this is dated March 19, 2015, <clears throat> and we received it yesterday afternoon. And their comments are, based on the information provided, please have the applicant address the following comments in a point-by-point -point response. Please verify the dates of the traffic count according to the worksheet provided in Appendix B. The weekday counts were conducted on 1-26-2015, which is a Monday, and the weekend counts were conducted on January 29, 2015, which is a Thursday. On page C23, E23, and F23 of the report, please update the intersection lane use and traffic control diagram, as well as the analysis for the Maryland 198 intersection with Maryland 197 to reflect field conditions Specifically, there are no right turn overlap phases and only the eastbound right turn is free flowing. Please identify the appropriate level of service on all CLV worksheets. The approach delays and intersections delays for the signalization intersection for all scenarios, AM, PM, and Saturday, different from table one in the TIS. And the values shown in the provided synchro files, please verify and update. Both the PM and Saturday synchro files have vehicles exiting the shopping center entrance at Irving Street. According to figure three, this access driveway does not have any existing lanes. Please correct and update. Errors, errors in the synchro file prevented both the PM and Saturday simulations from being reviewed. Please verify the codes and resubmit. The SHA will require the submission of one hard copy with a revised traffic impact study and a point-by-point -point response. That concludes the conditions of the State Highway Administration. Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So we have a, a lengthy sign-up sheet, but is there just any of the board members want to say anything before we get started? Or can we just start with the uh, sign-up sheet speakers? I have no questions. No questions? All right. So um, the initial sign is, is Kirk McCauley, a representative, I believe, for Wawa? Or is it just the Wawa agenda? Good evening, members of the board. Uh, my name is Kirk McCauley. I represent service station dealers in the state of Maryland. 
Um, not all members in Laurel are, are our members, but we even sort of represent the ones that don't know no better. So, uh, <laughs> and the, uh, the, the people here that are applying for this uh, permit or already apply and the appeal board, um, they're good people. They're, you know, they're a good Pennsylvania company that, uh, that runs cleans doors and, and nice operations. Uh, we're not here to knock them. We're here to tell you that the need study uh, for more gas in this area uh, is not needed. Uh, there's 30 some stations in the drive area that they put in their need study. Um, every one of them stations is down in volume and probably will continue to go down in volume. There will be peaks here and there at, at individual locations. But because of the federal highway gas standards, the mileage standards keep going up every year. So your new cars are getting better and better in mileage. I'm sure you all notice that when you drive around and fill your tank up how, how good a mileage you get. Well, the, the, the Federal Energy Administration estimates that we'll be losing 2 to 4 percent a year in gas mileage. I mean, in gas volume. And that, that does show right now. Uh, volume has been down for the last uh, peak year was 2007. So it's dropping 2 to 3 4 percent every year. So this need study, right now what we have is more than enough to, to take care of any need and future needs. And it's only going to get worse. It's going to be keep dropping. And our local stations will drop off some. When they, when they get down below a certain volume and they're not profitable no more, you'll have a blight. You'll have a station that's boarded up and trying to find something to do with it. Uh, but the need for gasoline is not there right now. Um, all the stations that I surveyed today um, were off 25 to 30 percent in volume over their, over their peak volume, which is not their maximum volume, but the, the peak that they've done. So uh, that, that's all I had to say. I'm glad to answer any questions anyone has. Well, that's uh, the Industry is going to be very hurting then when we have the um, electric cars coming in if they ever well, perfect that, that, that's, a, that's another thing that's going to cause the volume to drop the electric car the uh, The propane barrier cars the natural gas cars uh, Gasoline sales is dropping everywhere uh, So to build new stores um, it, it really hurts the existing businessmen other than fixing your daughters or sons tires changing their oil uh, doing the little things that we can do that they can't. They do things good. There's no, no question about it. No one's going to argue about that. Mm -hmm. um, they're good people. But the businessmen we have in this city and the businesswomen, I'll uh, get hollered at if I say that. <laughs> they do well too. And they've been here for a long time. Thank you. All right, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I thought that the uh, sign up sheet had. Yes. Uh, that the applicant would be the first one listed on sign-up sheet, and I do apologize. So what I do need is whoever is representing Wawa to come up to the podium and give us your name and address for the record, and then give us your spiel. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. Uh, Scott Barhank, an attorney at White for Taylor and Preston with offices in Towson, Maryland. Uh, and thank you for allowing us to come and make a brief presentation to you this evening. Um, not a regular uh, attorney here before your uh, your commission, before the Board of Appeals. Uh, so I appreciate uh, any guidance that you might have if I if I slip up in the procedure. I also was a little surprised that we go right into the uh, into the sheet, but I thought, well, that's how, that's fine. Uh, what I'd like to do is to introduce uh, the folks that are going to be speaking here this evening. Um, Jeff Glazer from Kimco Laurel is going to is on the sign and sheep. So as as we go through these names, yeah, they're yeah. part of the presentation, then you can you, you can dispense with having to call them. Uh, but Mr. Glazer is going to make a brief presentation. Uh, Mr. Mike Workowski is here, who is with Wells and Associates, who is our traffic engineer. Um, you notice that there was a recent State Highway Administration letter. I'd like to have Mr. Workowski speak briefly to the the status of that in the context of the access permit approval process. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Matt Jones is here, the civil engineer uh, who prepared the plan, so I'd like to have him speak just for a moment to make sure that the record is clear that we meet all the special exception requirements of the City of Laurel. Okay. Um, I'd also like to ask Mr. Joe Cronin, our market analyst, to be able to say a few words to you 
uh, all with the idea of giving the board the opportunity to, uh, to get to know the, the witnesses a little bit and to have the opportunity to ask them any questions that, that you might have as a result of the, uh, the work that's already been done uh, by the planning commission and the planning staff. It's my understanding that the planning staff report is already a part of your record. Yes. Um, and that all of the attachments to that, uh, which included Mr. Cronin's report and all the materials that were provided previously are also a part of the record, is, is what I understand. So uh, with that, unless the board has any questions of me, I'd like to ask Mr. Laser to come on up and uh, briefly present the application to you, and then we'll have each of the witnesses come through quickly. If that means that would be approved. fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Glazer. Mr. Mr. Glazer, your name and address for the record. Um, Jeff Glazer. Um, I'm the Vice President of Development for Kimco Realty for the Mid-Atlantic Region, based out of uh, Timonia, Maryland. Um, we are the owners of the shopping center. Um, we own both the retail buildings that are in front, um, facing 198, that has the restaurants and the thrift, and then the furniture in the back. Um, so we own the overall real estate. We have under contract um, the parcel that is getting merged into the overall property, which is the Carroll Weston Ware building um, that's facing on 198. Um, we've talked with the city of Laurel over many years about trying to get a better entrance, clean up areas of this parcel. Uh, we just got ourselves um, uh, annexed into the city of Laurel from PG. Half this property was in PG. Half was in the city of Laurel. Um, we then found Wawa, who was very interested in being in this market, being um, within this uh, location. We then got the property under control. Um, we are now in the process, and we're in front of you, um, showing the layout of the Wawa um, that has the full service convenience store, plus the gas that comes mm -hmm. with it. Um, the entrances and the travel paths uh, we've tried to modify our overall parking field to make sure that the flow of traffic to um, the existing traffic light is easy and accessible and safe. So we've modified the parking field. We'll be adding some additional landscaping there. Um, and we've also, from our last presentation, uh, we had a conversation with a couple of the, uh, one neighbor on Irving Street as this is only coming in from Irving. And so nobody can ever go out, um, but it's too wide. And we were hearing from the neighbors that it's just too wide. So um, we're, we've, we've done some additional engineering to look to narrow it. Uh, two things. We've uh, looked at trying to add some additional landscaping to buffer it from the residents and narrow up the drive lane with a sidewalk that pedestrians from, the, from that private street can have easier and safer access onto our property. So we're incorporating that as this project moves forward. I just wanted to share that that came up at our last meeting mm -hmm. um, and we've done further analysis. But the, um, you know, the Wawa, um, you know, is their standard um, convenience store. There are six pumps there um, servicing and um, that's all I have to share. Okay. So. Any questions of Mr. Glazier? <laughs> Not at this okay. time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'd next like to ask uh, Mr. Workowski to come up. He's our traffic engineer and to uh, speak briefly about his report that's already in the record, the traffic impact statement, as well as to address the most recent uh, presentation by the State Highway Administration in the context of the, the typical State Highway Administration access permit approval process, and then maybe give a, a quick opinion on whether there's any adverse impact uh, as a result of the additional traffic. Okay. Hi, Mr. Wachowski. Can you give us your name and address for the record, please? Hi, I'm Mike Wachowski. I'm with Wells & Associates. Uh, our offices are at 1420 Spring Hill Road in Tyson, Virginia, and we prepared the traffic study for the property. Um, we <clears throat> followed the typical method to prepare the traffic report. We submitted that report to the city and the State Highway Administration. As was read into the record, we recently received some comments on our traffic report. Um, the majority of those comments are some clarifications and such that is sort of typical as the, as the traffic study uh, goes through the access permit approval process. And so we, we will have to address each one of those comments in a point-by-point -point response. But many of those comments are more, um, uh, they're 
there's some technical parts to them as relates to operations at the intersection and such. Right. But they're not um, uh, fundamental changes in what was submitted. So I think, uh, you know, our traffic report really showed that there wouldn't be a, a significant impact over what you'd expect at the intersections with the uh, reworking of the site and the Wawa being in place. I think through addressing the comments that SHA's provided, we would still come to that same conclusion. Um, and we will have to satisfy those to, to get in. Well, that's what I was time. just going to say. These have to be satisfied. They, they do, yeah. Before you can proceed anyway, right. correct? Because <clears throat> it does, I mean, it is a tricky intersection, a tricky area. Um, and some of it is Greek to us because it says it must comply with C7, you know, what have you. So we're not really sure exactly what the details of it are. Well, I mean, these are things we... we you deal with all the we time. We deal with all the time. There, you know, there are, uh, if there are fundamental questions about, you know, assumptions or things that would be outcome changing, uh, that would be different. These are more technical in nature, and I think we could answer each one of those Without questions in point by point okay. and, and be able to satisfy them. Madam Chair, I have a question. Yes, certainly. How soon do you think you can, in fact, provide responses to these questions? Uh, we anticipate being able to resubmit next week after, the, after we've gone through this process and probably within a week or so. Okay. Thank you. I had a question. Is there some reason that they were so late in getting this to us? Just they're backed up as they are? No, I mean, it's just a, a, a typical time for them to review. They, they have a number of projects they review, and they sort of put them in line. And okay. That's their basic timing. All right. Any other questions? Yes, yes Madam Chair. Uh, one more. Uh, just for the record, this letter is fairly standard technical amendments, and there's uh, nothing unusual about it. And uh, due to lateness in time, there are times that we get this at the, I'm sure businesses get this at the last minute, I'm assuming. Yes. So this is fairly standard. It is. Okay. And your response should be fairly standard within a time frame that you respond. Uh, correct. I mean, our, our typical process is to respond as, as quickly as we can, obviously. But once it's back in their hands, it's back in the queue. So, um, you know, they, they need several weeks sometimes to get back to it and then respond. But that would be on uh, SHA, State Highway Administration. Correct. Thank you. That's what I want to clarify. Thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly. With regard to the State Highway Administration access permit approval process, uh, they're not obligated to respond any quicker than 45 days after we file. Uh, and it's also not unusual for us to have to have three, four, even sometimes five or six iterations back and forth before we actually get the letter that says that the access permit approval is there in concept. And that just gets you at the paper stage. Then they have to go actually do the design work for all the, the specific road designs. Um, so the point that I'm trying to make is that even if he is able to get the response back in a week, the highway administration is still going to be on a 45-day loop. There may even be another loop or two after that. After that. And that's just to get the letter. Then we have to go through the same kind of loop when we do the actual design of any improvements. Uh, the bottom line is, um, and I think the staff has already indicated this, and the planning commission as well, I believe, that any approval, should you desire to, to achieve approval here this evening, um, should be conditioned upon us achieving the, the proper State Highway Administration access permit, um, and that we'd be obligated to provide any improvements that would be required by the State Highway Administration. Okay. Thank you. That clarifies it for me. There we go. Care. Mm -hmm. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Jones to come up and just offer a few brief comments from the perspective of a civil engineer um, as it relates to the various uh, special exception requirements. As you're aware, there's a general special exception requirement overall, but then there's also specific requirements that might relate to a specific use, in this case, the gas station complex. So I'd like Mr. Jones to briefly express his familiarity with the project and then uh, talk a little bit about the meeting the requirements. Okay, thank you. Mr. Jones, may I have your name and address for the record. Uh, good evening. Happy to speak tonight. Uh, I hope everybody's well. Uh, Matt Jones with Bowler Engineering. My address is 16701 Belford Boulevard, uh, Bowie, Maryland, 20715. Uh, I am a professional engineer uh, by background, and I'm uh, here on behalf of Kemco Laurel, Inc. Um, I guess to, to get started here, uh, we spent a great deal of time, uh, as, uh, as mentioned by our team earlier on this presentation, 
uh, with regard to uh, the Wawa layout, the site design, the layout of the driveway, siding of the building, utilizing existing access points. And there's very specific criteria that uh, had to be considered uh, and demonstrated in order to, to meet those requirements. And you know, those requirements uh, are, are both for a gas station complex, the zoning ordinance, the master plan, a uh, whole host of requirements that uh, in concert uh, were, were utilized to create uh, the site layout that's before you tonight. Um, and I, I can tell you that the city did a wonderful job uh, analyzing those criteria, and um, I'm very familiar with them, and I agree that all those criteria have been met. Um, uh, with regard to the master plan, uh, the site's in harmony with the master plan. We meet all the zoning ordinance requirements. Um, this site has uh, no greater uh, no greater impact uh, than, than what would normally be uh, you know would go here and uh, we we absolutely um, we absolutely uh, believe that all the criteria have been met okay any questions of mr. Jones uh, just for the record uh, madam chair uh, the law firm where I'm employed we've used this bowler office on many of our projects However, I don't know Mr. Jones personally, and I don't believe that would, it will uh, affect my ability to sit on this project, but I did want to get that on the record. All right. Thank you. I okay. think probably um, we shouldn't have any issue with that. Do you? If he feels that it's not going to put him in a position to, to compromise. be right. um, unbiased in sitting on this case, I think it's fine. Okay, it's been disclosed. All right, thank you, Mr. Whitley. And are you going to talk about the needs analysis, Mr. Jones? Uh, no, Mr. Uh, Joe Cronin, uh, that's, that's here okay. uh, with us, will we'll speak directly about the uh, needs analysis. You well anticipate our next witness. Thank you, Mr. Jones, for right. those questions. <laughs> uh, I do want to make a note, a real quick observation about Wawa's. I've done a number of them. And I never could understand why people liked them so much until I actually got involved in some of their projects and learned that one of the things they do that's unique to the industry is that they make sure that all the parking spaces are wider than required, all the drive aisles are wider than required, not only on the site, but actually uh, the way they lay out their, uh, their stores inside. If you'll think about it, next time you go to a Wawa, you'll feel like you have more space than usual. It's because that's actually deliberate. They actually designed them that way uh, so that most of the parking spaces, most of the drive aisles, and most of the walk aisles even inside are a little bit more spacious than the minimum requirements. And that's one of the reasons why people like them is because you don't feel that crowded, cramped feeling that you often get. Um, I didn't realize that until I actually started doing some of these projects. And thought, oh, now, now I understand. I'll pay attention. I also like your songs. So. <laughs> so anyway, let me, do, without further ado, ask Mr. Cronin to come up, and uh, he's our market analyst who did the need study that's a part of the record, and ask him to talk a little bit about his credentials and then to walk, away through, uh, walk you through the, the methodology of the report. And, yes, and if it's appropriate, we have some extra copies we'd like to give you if you think things like need is one of the main issues that the, uh, the opposition might have. We'd be happy to have yeah. that in front of you this evening. We can give you extra copies of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good evening. My name is Joe Cronin, and um, I'm the Senior Managing Director with Valbridge Property Advisors, Lipman, Frizzell, and Mitchell. We're located at 6240 Old Dobbin Lane, Columbia, Maryland, 21045. Thank you. Um, so uh, the report that I just handed you is the analysis uh, of need for the, um, the subject station here. Um, wanted to make sure that you got a beautiful color copy so that you could uh, be awed by the maps, etc. Um, it's a... Um, 
in summary, let me just go to the executive summary and we can walk through the, the basic uh, methodology, et cetera. Um, in consumer uh, market research, the first thing that you have to do is to find a trade area. Try to figure out, based on a, the location and the use that you have um, in any particular case, well, where is it going to draw people from? Okay, And so um, I looked at the location, drove the area, et cetera, and um, made the determination that a trade area that's defined by drive time, uh, which is fairly standard in the convenience store business, of about 10 minute drive time, would give us um, an idea of the consumer demand that was available to this particular station. So um, that and the map uh, for that trade area is later on in the report. You can get a look at it. So basically, we have a site here which <clears throat> is close to the real uh, crossroads in Laurel, which is Route One and One Ninety Eight. I mean. That's really uh, first in Maine, you know, right there. And um, I can see that based on state um, highway administration numbers, there's about 40,000 cars that drive in front of this site on a daily basis. This is a very heavily trafficked area, and it's very close to, <coughs> in addition, the Route 1 corridor, which is also very heavily traveled. You've got a lot of traffic coming in from every um, uh, point in the compass, okay? And also a lot of people coming through uh, on their way to 95 or whatever, okay? So um, we've got a trade area, which um, I feel is reasonable to uh, define where consumers are coming from here. <coughs> Looking at the trade area, page two in my report in the executive summary again, um, there are about 42,000 households living within, just within that trade area. And I'm not considering people who are coming through the trade area from outside. I'm not considering people who are working in Laurel, for example. I'm just talking about the residents who are in this area. So this is a very conservative um, estimate of demand. I'm just looking at residents within this area. There are about 42,000 households that are relatively affluent with a, um, an average household income of over $93,000 a year. Most of them are homeowners. Um, they have uh, very high value homes, about $340,000 is the average value. Um, the number of vehicles per household averages at almost two, 1.8. The most, uh, most of the workers, 87% almost, drive to work or carpool to work. Uh, and over half of them have commute times that are fairly long, over half an hour. So we have the profile of a market area which is very populous, which has um, relatively high incomes, uh, is pretty affluent, and where the driving behavior is a very suburban driving behavior. People drive pretty much everywhere. And uh, so that's the kind of profile that we have as we then look at the consumer demand issue. Um, my estimate of consumer demand based on um, the consumer expenditure survey and done by the Bureau of Labor Statistics for the federal government and the Census Bureau, um, based on good, uh, reliable statistics, my estimate of demand um, from households in that area is over 45 million gallons of gasoline a year. Absolutely, a lot of gasoline is being demanded by the residents there. In addition to that, we have more demand coming in for, through uh, commuters who don't live in that area, workers who um, work in the city of Laurel, et cetera. So, Again, my feeling is that that demand is estimated uh, relatively uh, conservatively. I also looked, so that's the demand side. That's the need. I also looked at the supply side um, based on uh, the requirements of the City of Laurel um, uh, regulations 
uh, for a special exception. Looking at the City of Laurel supply, I found that there were 10 uh, competitor gas stations that are mainly located along the Route 1 corridor, a couple of other ones also. Um, they're all listed in the report um, and um, you know, found that the stations were, uh, at least by my observation, when I was uh, driving Route 1 and you know, looking at the gas stations, they were fairly busy. Um, they, were, they tended to be older, smaller kinds of locations. Um, and, um, but they seem to be doing, you know, fair business. Okay. I also looked at other supply outside the city of Laurel. Okay. In the, uh, suburban areas within that, uh, 10 minute drive distance. Okay. And I found that there were 17 other stations, uh, located outside there. And, um, again, drove them, looked at them. And by and large, business seemed to be fairly good, you know, in, in most of the stations. So um, my assumption is that, uh, that most of the stations are doing reasonably well um, and are um, at least um, performing at an average, um, uh, you know, uh, pumping uh, gallonage. Uh, and... So they're probably um, uh, pumping uh, about 39 million gallons of gasoline a year would be my <coughs> estimate for the entire supply, which doesn't meet the demand just within uh, the residential area within that 10 minute drive time. So my finding is that there is plenty of demand out there and there's plenty of demand for uh, the stations today and tomorrow if Wawa would uh, um, be granted the special exception. Plenty of um, demand for them all to compete for. Um, this is not an area that um, uh, is going to um, uh, go electric uh, car <laughs> uh, tomorrow uh, by any means. And uh, on the contrary, it's going to continue growing and uh, as household the number of households would grow, the, the demand for gasoline would uh, also increase on a relative basis also. So that's basically my findings as I uh, did my analysis. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I have a couple of questions. Uh, what percentage of the unmet consumer demand would this station uh, satisfy? I'd say the issue with consumer demand, the issue with need, is that um, it's a um, um, uh, it's a situation where, as you uh, uh, shift the competitive mix, okay, um, you know, then. Um, Things will change. Uh, the other gas stations might um, improve themselves, might compete on a different basis. It's always hard to say exactly uh, what the new competitive, uh, 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 you know, stable array is going to be. I'd say uh, this gas station. My assumption would be that um, this is going to pump, you know, two to three million gallons of gasoline a year. Um, in, in addition to um, having a viable convenience store kind of, um, uh, you know, a business model also. So its business model doesn't depend solely on uh, gasoline sales. It also depends on uh, the convenience store being a, a, a real um, service, uh, you know, convenient and accommodating to the public. So uh, your report says there's, there's roughly six and a half million gallons per year of unmet consumer demand. So it would take up a, a third or a half. Something like that would be my estimate. Okay. And again, that's not all of the demand that's in the market. That's the residential demand. You know, since I was focused mainly on uh, people who pay taxes in the city of Laurel, people who are you know residing in the area. In addition to that. There's demand from 
um, folks who work in Laurel, you know, and in the environs, uh, people who are uh, commuters through uh, the market area, they also buy gasoline clearly too. So again, the uh, estimate is done, um, you know, uh, on a relatively conservative basis, in my opinion, um, focusing on resident households rather than total demand, you know, which is going to be something larger than what consumer research will get to through this methodology. And what's your understanding of the definition of need? Is it a uh, convenient and useful, or what's your understanding of that definition as it relates to this application? Um, I'm not an attorney, okay? Um, and I don't play one on TV, okay? <laughs> but the, the, um, my understanding from previous cases is that the Maryland uh, definition is, uh, is it convenient and accommodating to the public? I'm also aware of, you know, the zoning ordinance in Laurel, which then goes within that and asks for additional information on, you know, um, the specifics that I tried to address here in terms of the number of stations and are we doing something that the other stations aren't doing? I mean, and one of the things that we're doing is we're offering, it seems to me, or the Wawa is offering, um, a location where convenience and accommodation of the public can really happen based on a, um, a more um, contemporary uh, station design, based on the ability to fill up and walk into the convenience store with a pretty broad array of convenience items all in one trip, and also the locational convenience of this particular location on uh, 198. Um, you know, near the shopping center here. Thank you. And just so everybody knows, Wawa doesn't do any auto <coughs> repair, correct? I'm sorry, just not. The Wawas don't do any auto repair. It's strictly just sale of gasoline and the convenience store. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Jones? No? Thank you very much. Thank you. Wait one second. Yes. Oh, I'm so sorry. You wanted to ask questions. Okay. Yes. yes. <coughs> Back to the podium, sir. Sorry. No, I represent Mr. No, as the person. Uh, my address is 11 North Washington Street, Rockville, Maryland. I'm at the law firm of Line and Line Instructions. I represent Mr. Could you speak into the microphone? Sure, I'd be happy to. And a little slower. Sure. <laughs> uh, my name is James Parsons. Thank and I you. represent Mr. Ahmad, who's present here this evening. I'm with a law firm of Linet, Linet and Parsons in Rockville, Maryland. And I have some questions for, for Mr. Cronin. Could, could you please state the purpose of your representation so that we'll know him, Mr. Ahmad? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm representing Mr. Ahmad in connection with his opposition to this application. He is a uh, service station dealer in the Laurel area. And what, what particular uh, area, sir? So we'll know what, what area uh, we're talking about. The station is uh, Laurel Park Shell, and I'm also representing ADY Inc which is his corporation that runs the station, is Laurel Park Shell, located at 825 Roman <coughs> Avenue, Laurel, Maryland, 20707. I'm sorry. At the Y on Route 1. Okay, that's what I thought. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Certainly. Uh, Mr. Crone, I've, I've reviewed your, your need analysis, and I see that you came up with a demand of 38 million gallon, excuse me, a supply of 38 million, that's your that was your estimate, is that correct? Yes. Now that was uh, not based upon actual numbers, that was just based on your estimate, is that correct? Correct. Now that was based upon 27 gasoline stations within the trade area, is that correct? Correct. Now if there were actually 35 stations within a 10 minute drive of the subject station, would that affect your analysis? It could. Well, let me ask a specific question. You, the way you calculated the 38 million was that you took, uh, you estimated that each station does an average of 120,000 gallons per year. You multiplied per month. Per yeah. month, excuse me. And you multiplied that times 12 and came up with 1.44 million per year. Is that correct? And then you multiplied that times 27 gas stations. Correct. Right. 
And then you subtracted that number from the 45 million gallon demand that you estimate for this area. Is that correct? Correct. Now, if you took another eight stations and multiplied that times 1.44 million, that would mean that the supply actually exceeded the demand, would it not? Which, of course, would be. <coughs> so, but, you know, your math calculation might be correct. But again, that would go to the issue of um, we've estimated demand conservatively based on uh, just the residential population. And therefore, you know, uh, though I did my best to identify all the stations there, if indeed there were, there was something on this, then it, it would ultimately, uh, you can't have uh, supply exceeding demand. It doesn't work that way. And so therefore, it would go to the issue of we have uh, more demand based on computers and um, employment than is evident from the residential population alone. OK. Well, you, you, the way you calculated the 10-minute drive time, the report says that it's a standard driving time considered reasonable for consumers seeking convenience services. Right. It doesn't say gasoline, right? Since this is a convenience store with a gasoline operation, they really work hand in hand in glove. Would it so be? Okay. They're, the, they're, the, they're basically the same. Would it be unreasonable for a person to drive over 10 minutes to get cheaper gasoline? Uh, it depends on the person, I suppose. Uh, you know, some people. Uh, we'll drive probably over 10 minutes for a penny a gallon difference. Most people won't. So I'd say, you know, uh, the 10 minutes is um, sort of an industry, not sort of, is an industry standard uh, sort of rule of thumb uh, that would indicate, generally speaking, well, where are people coming from? Do you think that the existing stations could accommodate approximately another three uh, uh, customers per hour? They're, let's just use the 27 stations that you referred to. What they can accommodate and what they you know, uh, do accommodate are, are probably two different things. If you wanted to have people uh, lined up, you know, uh, beginning of the day to the end of the day, lining up at every station, you could probably accommodate uh, more consumers. The reality is that um, you know stations in this area tend to um, do fairly well, um, at, in my opinion. But um, you know, uh, can can they always can any station accommodate more people? Sure. Are you aware of a single incidence where any dealer in this area was unable to? serve a customer based upon a shortage of fuel? To the best of my knowledge, no fuel has been shut off to this area to test that thesis. You know, um, the uh, tanker trucks keep rolling. Um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, nobody's refused uh, customers because um, they've had too much business. Um, that's not the way these things work. Did you ask a single dealer in this trade area whether they were at their capacity in selling motor fuel. In my experience, uh, no dealer will ever admit that they're at their capacity. I mean, realistically, this is business. You'd always like to sell a couple more gallons or a couple hundred or a couple thousand more gallons. So capacity isn't really the issue. The issue is consumer behavior and consumer demand. Well, you're talking about unmet demand. Isn't that related to capacity? It's, it's related to capacity in sort of the normal course of business. It's not saying you've got a station and uh, what would be their capacity if they um, had lines around the clock, um, you know, at their station. That's, a, that's not a good business model. Uh, capacity is, basically speaking, what uh, do stations sell, and um, what, um, and how do they compete for the sales that are available in an area? 
some stations will do better than other stations and for whatever reasons. They might be selling gasoline a little bit cheaper. They might be offering better services. They might have a better uh, national brand. Um, there are any number of reasons why stations sell better or worse, but none of them sell at a, their capacity, which would be you know having a station uh, where you had uh, cars lined up you know, uh, and pumping gas 24 hours a day. Capacity is not really um, you know, a useful concept here. Mr. Parsons, it was Mr. Parsons, yes? yes? Did you attend the planning commission on behalf of your client? No, I did not. did not. Is there some reason this wasn't brought up at that meeting? Um, Madam Chair, I was retained in this matter yesterday, so. Uh -huh. Aha, I see. Well, um, I'm not sure if uh, a complete inquisition of um, the um, applicant is appropriate. I, I may be wrong on that. May I have a, an opinion on that? <coughs> Generally speaking, in a case such as this, it would be appropriate for the opposition to essentially cross-examine the witness who testified, but only with respect to what they had testified to. You can't go outside those parameters. All right. One more question. Oh, all right. Okay. Um, is it correct? Uh, your report is based upon statistics and your estimates and not based upon actual sales data in this trade area? Uh, in my experience, trying to get actual sales numbers um, out of gasoline uh, station owners, especially when uh, you're bringing in new competition, is uh, virtually impossible. No, I'd say really impossible. Uh, so therefore, um, I have not relied on trying to survey the um, uh, competition uh, in this matter. I've used uh, estimates that I've found to be uh, reliable uh, over the years and using good um, census and other government data that uh, can better predict uh, what's going to happen in this particular market. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, can we just yes. make sure that the record's clear? Mr. Parsons, you've had an opportunity to ask all the questions you want to ask. You've had an opportunity to yes, ask I, all the I, questions I, you want. Okay. You. Just want to make sure that the record's clear. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Madam Chair, uh, that would be the conclusion of our presentation this evening. We really appreciate the, the time that you've given us. Um, I do want to make sure that uh, the board is aware. Mm -hmm. Uh, that Mr. Cronin has been recognized uh, in many jurisdictions as an expert in market analysis. If you have any questions about his, his profession, uh, we would certainly like give you that opportunity. Uh, but I think he's been recognized uh, many times uh, in, the, in the area of need uh, and as uh, testified here tonight uh, in accordance of industry standards uh, in his profession. So you, you offered him as an expert? Yes. All right. As um, I would Mr. Jones, who's an expert civil engineer, as I would Mr. Workhouse. I would assume you would only bring engineer. experts. Yes, that's, again, that's, thank you for your assistance. I, uh, <laughs> my first time before this panel, I wasn't exactly sure what all, all the rules of engagement were, so thank you for indulging me. Well, you want, want to review? It'd be nice just to. Can you kind of review the layout of the yes, gas station? Sure. Um, we were asked not to move that easel by the gentleman who. Uh, I mean, I can see it. The, it would just be nice the, to. Uh, does the AV. So I'll ask Mr. Glazer yeah. to come over. And if you uh, <coughs> have a, a render site plan, that might even be better. Um, because this puts it in context. Okay. You can know? you see that? Okay? Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. um, okay. As I stated earlier, the only access coming off of Irvine is coming in. And it'll be a single lane coming in. Right now, it's too wide that people sometimes go out <laughs> it. and there's big signs that say "Do not enter." It's people still go through it. It used to be two ways on a daily right. basis. So anyway, that's the way in. And then what we have is complete circulation. All the other access points on 198 stay exactly where they are. Um, this is where the traffic signal sits going into the center. What we've done is we've taken the parking and we. We've shifted this down so we had a clean drive lane to get the consumer to that traffic light. 
So if somebody's coming in here and they want to come back out, you've got to divide a median, you're going to make a right-hand turn only. Mm -hmm. Or you can come past the traffic light and make a right-hand turn in. But if you're going back to the parkway, um, you're going to come back to this traffic light and move that. The other piece that was important was when we did push this down, we lost parking spaces, but we're still over parked on the property. Um, and we then allowed ourselves to put a nice landscape tree aisles that make that pathway. Within here, the bays of the gas station are, there are six pumps up front that have two sides, those 12, but six pumps up front here. And then the Wawa convenience store that has parking that on three sides of it. And the main entrance is right in front facing 198. Madam Chair, if I could ask a question, and pardon me um, if it's in the material and I missed it. What is the size, the total square footage of, of the of the Wawa building itself? Yes, I'm going to look over to my right. Forty-six thousand square feet, right? Just over four thousand square feet. And how does that compare to the uh, Carol's Western store that was there? Uh, smaller. Than, smaller. Uh, okay. The existing building is approximately. Thank you. Thank you. Does that help, Florian? Yeah, it's just, I, you know, I grew up on Irving Street, and I know the traffic there, and, and there's always someone coming out the wrong way, so right. that kind of makes me a little bit nervous. Right. Um, but you said you're going to narrow that lane? We're going to narrow this down to a single wide. We're going to put a sidewalk on the side of the resident, and we're going to landscape additional landscaping there. And then, then where you have the exit going out to where the traffic light is on 198. Yes. I mean, there's Christmas tree sales yeah. there. There's somebody that does car detailing. All that stops. Okay. When we annex this back into the city of Laurel, city of Laurel does not allow any of those <clears throat> activities on the okay. property. So when they annex us in, the staff first thing is the car wash, the Christmas trees all go away okay. so none of that will happen out here any longer and then the flow of traffic will be clearly marked so people know when they're leaving that wawa yeah. they cannot go back out on irving street they're going to go right. back around and correct and, and this will be narrowed and we'll put additional signs there absolutely right now that section right there at the corner um right where irving street that's just okay. all still going to be the way it is now right it's just kind of dirt and it's it's Over indented here. there yeah just additional landscaping and some storm water issues right there okay Thank you. Thank you very much. Hand I know. Well, right. Yes, of course. <coughs> uh, could you come to the podium oh, and okay. give us your name and address, please? Uh, my name is Richard Janicki. I live at 2 Del Place, Laurel, right, uh, right off Irving Street. I have a question for the gentleman. Certainly. The design. Sure. <laughs> I'll right down the street here in Laurel. I agree with the shop set up quite frequently. I have no problem with Wawa, I love all myself. Right. Like you say, people currently come out of that parking lot to try and make a left hand turn to go to the light to go out to 198 and 197. Right. Frequently. Uh -huh. Down here just Friday night. Yeah. At the intersection of the light is. There's a job last mm -hmm. I've seen it there numerous times. And I have this parking lot up here on this end. Where this is the second avenue to um, uh, second hand store. Yeah. Okay. I'm going here's all kind of buffet. Everybody yeah, knows where we are, right? Mm -hmm. You guys know where we are. Mm -hmm. Yes. See this car here? Well, you can't see this. In this picture, this is wide enough for two vehicles to get out. Nine times out of ten, half of those cars will be going straight across when they go left, come down to get on 197. Yeah. Accidents happen there quite frequently. <coughs> It's going to add more traffic. It's already congested area. And the 7-Eleven. Madam Chair, is there a question mark that's going to be at the end of this? At some yes. Point? I think you're supposed to be asking Mr. Glazer a question. Yes, I was. Sorry. Okay. This is the first time I've ever been in companies like this. Okay. I have, I've never had any um, reason to attend. Reason to come out. There you okay. go. Well, now you okay. do, so we'll get with okay. it. Okay. Now, is this. By putting this here, how is that going to do? It, it's going to convenience. Okay, I agree. Moving ahead, 
you know, is the two twenty two. How is this going to? Uh, is your concern they, that they're going to come out of that driveway and go across? Yes, like they do already. They do How already. That, right. How is that going to stop that from happening? It's not going to stop it's it from happening. Okay. Yeah, they, the one thing about individuals and drivers, they do what they want. I can't control. Right. But what I can do, one of your neighbors mentioned, if you, I'll just take one second, one of your neighbors down here and came and shared with us the concerns. So we think narrowing that up so people won't go two ways out, right. putting additional signs here will help, yeah. putting additional signs here. This is clearly a right in, right out right. movement here. It, it was, but I like right turn only, they just take out a little bit, right turn only by right turn only by right turn only by traffic control. Um, no, they'll still do what they want. They'll still shoot, still, still shoot there. across. Okay. You have that happen daily. There's just is human nature to, for some reason or other, they think everybody's going to stop and allow them to cross the four lanes of traffic to get there. I mean, it's just, I, I mean, we, I wish we could. Yeah. I wish, but there's no way you could yeah, change that problem. drawing to prevent them from doing it. So, I, I know, I know, I know, it's terrible. Yeah, and if people don't pay attention, they cause accidents. Anyway, yes. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. That concludes our presentation. Are there any other questions from the team? Okay. Um, speakers, we still have some listed on the sign-up sheet. And we do, if they want to speak, then we need to let I them speak. I think probably, the next five or six are probably the folks in our group that you've already heard from. So I thought I crossed. All those. Um, okay. Bar height, laser. Got crossed all those off. We have Scott. That's you, right. Yes. Okay, that's you. I didn't cross you off. Joe Duncan, Sahad Warwick. Yep. Okay, all right. So if there's no one else to speak, oh, we have a second sign up sheet. I'm sorry, we have a second sign up sheet. That's a first. Um, so who's coming up? Well, you've already been up. <laughs> <laughs> Who's? I'm sorry. So, if Mr. Um, uh, what was the last name you just read, Mr. Um, um I said uh, uh, Sahad Warish. Right. If you want to speak now, would be the time to come up and. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for giving me time to speak out. Uh, my name is. Sajjad and I have station on 197, address is uh, 12601 Laurel Bui Road and I'm doing business in Laurel for the last 15 years and I've been pumping a lot of gallons, you know, the business is declining every day, day by day and my business is down around 30% than compared to 2002. Wow, people are saying that there is a demand and the needs of the and other station in Laurel, I don't think so. We have 27 stations within four miles. That is more than enough. And if we go outside the Laurel, just a mile on each side of the Laurel, that count goes to 35, including two big boxes. On the 20, uh, 295 side, there's the Sam, uh, Sam Club station on Route 1 towards the 32, there is another base station and if we go towards Burdenwell, just across the 95, there is a dash in coming up with 16 MPDs. And if we go towards Bellsville, the Wawa is already there. I don't see that where the demands are. Okay, and the next point is, this is a gasoline. Now I go up to the con uh, convenience stores within the city limit of Laurel. There are six 7-Elevens. That is enough for the, seven, for, for the city of Laurel population, which is 25,000 people. We do have it eight subways. We do have it three Mac, McDonald's. We do have it three Popeyes. I don't see that demands. So I simply say that we don't need a Wawa in Laurel. That's all. Thank you, Duran. All right, sir. Thank you very much for giving us your opinion. Thank you. Okay, Richard Janowski. Janicki, that was you. Okay, well, I've got to get this list done. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> My question, thank you for answering, and I, to me, it's not a short attack, anybody. Um, 
I said, I do live off of off, off Irving Street. Um, I'd like to find the police to get it when I'm get the police to put one of those little traffic lights that say how fast you're going, slow the traffic down a little bit. It's it's quite on busy 198? on 198. No, on Irving Street. On Irving Street. Yeah, they come flying through there. Uh, that's going to be another access to their their great store. Um, I don't believe we need another gas station here in town either. Nothing against Wawa. Really, it isn't. Um, I'm thinking of the residential side of where I live. Um, like down by where the fire department is and the railroad tracks <coughs> underpass is, they put a traffic light in there. Uh, it used to be on a sidewalk for the underpass, like they have at the end of Main Street. That's created more congestion without it. If I think that if they allow that out what to go in there, it's going to create more congestion on that intersection. Um, not to mention the no, I, what I haven't heard is anybody saying anything about an environmental impact. Right behind the Second Avenue store is our beloved Patuxent. Whenever the WSSC decides to let water go, it floods the Legion. Behind the Legion is the wall, is the secondhand store. There's going to be spillage, not massive amounts. No matter where you go with any gas station, they're going to have spillage. It may contaminate the Patuxent River. Well, that's, that's probably been taken into consideration with the studies that everyone's well, done. I haven't heard anybody saying about it, but that's just one of the couple of concerns I have about it. And if you if you think that the Irving Street should have uh, the traffic monitor, I think you should go to the city and suggest it. Right. But I don't think it's part of our meeting this evening. Right, but I'm just saying the traffic is already busy as it is. It'd be nice to slow it down, but I'm saying it's don't already put busy. speed bumps in. Please don't <laughs> put speed can't bumps. Can't put speed bumps in. because the fire department. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I'm just saying it's already congested as it is. We don't need any more traffic coming in. That's all. Okay. okay. Thank you so Thank much. You for your time. Thank you. Have a great night. You too. All right, who wants to speak next? Madame? <laughs> my name is Shirley Levy. I just saw you do my husband, Stan. He was killed on December the 1st. He's been a property owner in law for probably 60 years. He was the builder and original owner of Laurel Plaza Shopping Center. Now, Sam was approached at the time, I just know from being his wife, because I was never involved in any of the business. He was approached by Exxon when he built that shopping center to put a location on the corner where the Wawa is proposed. He knew the congestion it would cause, so instead he put in a bank. And the bank, of course, wasn't going to cause congestion, it didn't. The bank was eventually replaced with a Western apparel store. And I think that's where these folks are planning to go in. I had wanted really to come here to help them tonight because I like to see people grow. I like to see people achieve in life. And particularly with it being Stan Shopping Center where it was going, you know, I wanted to help them. But then I realized what it would do to the people on Irving Street, the bright lights in their windows at night. The traffic there is horrendous. I've been out there maybe six or eight times since Stan passed because I was trying to rent a house there on the corner. I could barely make it across the street for the traffic. Traffic would be coming from both directions, up to go to the Wawa and to the convenience store, and also to come in. It really isn't a good idea. Stan didn't think so back in 1963 to have a gas station there on the corner, and that's why he put the bank in. And Mr. Adler is here tonight. Most of our renters have been with us for many years. Dave, would you like to say something? Yeah, I'd like to, but well, I think I pretty much said it all, unless you want to ask me any questions that I might have the answer to. Any questions? Oh, no. Mrs. Levy? Thank you no, for coming thank out. Thank you very much for coming out. Thank you. I don't know if there's a speaking where I, I saw a sign up in this, and I was on the bottom. <laughs> people in front of me. Yeah, you're midway down, and so you're up. Why don't you come on? My name is David Vavra. I live on Irving Street. I live about two doors from where the station is going to be. Um, I'm all for economic development and I'm all for competition. However, the one thing that I don't like about this 
particular process is that no one ever contacted me about this. Nobody asked my opinion. It's laudable that you asked somebody on Irving Street, but you should have asked everybody, not just one person. Uh, to be honest with you, Irving Street is very congested. There are times when I can't get in or out of my driveway because of the traffic. This is just going to increase the traffic. I like the idea that you're narrowing that entrance okay? uh, because there are people that do come out that way. I don't know whether that'll stop them. Uh, <clears throat> there is one thing about that though that when there's an accident at 197 and 198, the traffic that's coming down 198 to the east-west comes through and out through that exit. So I don't know. Um, I'm also concerned about the lighting that's going to be placed in there. There's enough light right now at night that's very annoying, particularly coming from Home Depot, which has these, these enormous stadium lights up. <laughs> So if anything like that is planned, I'm certainly against it. Sorry. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that on this market study, which appears to be a non-study, he could have gone and planted cars that are going in and out of the different stations. Didn't do that, apparently. Going in and out of the gas stations? Yes. It's an estimate as to how much traffic they actually have. Across the street from where this station is going to be is another gas station with a convenience store. Mm -hmm. It certainly doesn't run at capacity. It is never crowded. Okay? It's an almost exact copy of what they want to put on the other side of 198. All I think this is going to do is increase congestion. It's really going to be upsetting to who is living on urban. It should be anyway. Uh, and I don't think it really serves a purpose. Oh, that's all I have to say. Did I understand that you rent from Mrs. Levy? Yes, I do. That's probably why you didn't get any any notice, official notice. I think well, the city I, only sends notice out officially to the owners of the property. I, I not agree. To be I, I think it was. I think it was in per. I'm sorry, in your company. I believe it was in the interest of the shopping center to have done this. All right. Okay, and I'm rather upset that, you know, I didn't learn about this until a couple of days ago. Okay. So. All right. Well, thank you for your opinion. Sure. We will take note of it. All right, I believe I still have a few more that have not come up to the podium. Um, Aruna Sharma? No? She there? <coughs> Speaking of no. all your peace. Okay. Um, did I miss Dan Lynch? I'm here for McDonald's. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't say that on my sheet. It just says Dan Lynch. Okay. Um, I I think. Um, uh, forgive me on this name. Um, e T I K H A R, Hamas. Hamas. Is that you, sir? That's my client. And that's your client. Okay. All right. Great. Okay. I think we have exhausted then um, the speaker list. I, I signed up also. If I may come out here and make a presentation. Certainly. Thank you. Here comes that lady. Which lady? Again, I'm James Parsons representing Mr. Ahmad, who's here tonight, uh, and his company, ABY Inc. Um, he owns the gas station at 825 Gorman Avenue, Laurel, Maryland, 20707, and he'll be testifying on behalf of himself and his corporation. Uh, of course, he's opposed to this application, and the basis for the opposition is that this application, the applicant has failed to satisfy the requirements of the city code. Uh, we start with the requirement, of course, that it's the applicant's burden of proof in this. Uh, they have the burden of going forward with the evidence and the burden of persuasion on all questions, okay. the fact which are to be by the At the, uh, of course, this is for a gas station complex, and section 20-22.41 contains the specific requirements for this use. 
I'm going to focus on the specific issue here. Subsection 8 of that section says uh, the applicant must show by a preponderance of the evidence that the necessity exists for the proposed retail sale of automotive fuel due to an insufficient number of gas stations presently available to serve existing population concentrations in the city. Now the need analysis presented to find the trade area as within a 10 minute drive of the subject property. The report states that there are 27 stations within the trade area as defined by the need analysis. We will show that there are actually 35 stations within a 10 minute drive of this subject property. And there are over 30 within a three mile radius. Uh, the case of Lucky Stores versus Board of Appeals uh, in that case, the Court of Appeals dealt with a similar issue involving a, separate, a special exception for a gas station. In that case, there were 20 stations within a 3.9 mile radius. And the Court decided, uh, the Board of Appeals of Montgomery County decided or denied the application. And in reviewing the case, the Court of Appeals said that that was the greatest concentration of filling stations in the general neighborhood than any reported case at that time. Here we have over 30 stations within a three mile radius and over 35 within a 10 minute drive. How so long ago was that done? The, the Lucky Stores case was in 1973. That was a long time ago before the population increased. <laughs> uh, and so, what, but it's our position that there are more than a sufficient number of gas stations available to serve mm -hmm. the existing population concentrations in the city. There's a huge amount of unused capacity to sell gasoline gas gasoline for these 35 gas stations. So there is no unmet demand. Uh, so for this reason, the application should be denied. And I'd like to call Mr. Joseph Duncan to testify. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, my name is Joe Duncan and <coughs> I, uh, after spending 31 years in the Army, I bought a business in the city of law. And it's been great ever since. Now, I got rid of that business, and now I have to North Law, and they are gasoline stations. They are far enough away that uh, Wawa is not really going to bother me, and I'm a good enough dealer that I won't let them bother me, if right. you know what I mean. But uh, I do want to say, uh, I know this map is a little busy, uh, but uh, as uh, Mr. Parson... You can't move it. You can't move it. You can't move it. Oh, you can't yeah. move it? Well, yeah. okay. All right. I hope you folks can, can see it. Uh, let me try to get some point. The, uh, there are 10 stations in the city limits of law. One of which I have marked in red that the needs analysis missed. They didn't, no, they didn't see. It. The green arrows, uh, the green uh, green stars, are stations that is within as they defined the Laurel Trade Area. All the green ones and the gold ones are what they identified as being in the Laurel Trade area. Now, the, uh, the red ones were stations that they missed. That's how we came up 35 gas stations in what they have defined as the Laurel Trade area. I didn't define it. I don't even know whether I would agree with it, but the, the needs analysis defined the trade area. So, and, and as, as Mr. Parson indicated, if you count the stations within that, uh, that three mile radius, there's 30 of them there. A third more, or, or 50% more than the Lucky case. Uh, now, let's talk about the demand issue. Before we do that, did you measure the distance, the 10 minute distance yourself? I did. I did it twice to make sure, you know, in case there was traffic or anything like that. And the 10 minute, uh, <clears throat> a 10 minute driving distance is correct. 
and it was roughly what they had, although they, although they missed a, a, a couple, or you know, a few stations. When did you do that? Today, all morning. <coughs> have you identified? <laughs> excuse me. Have you identified, for the record, the stations you believe have been missed? Would you point out the ones that they missed? And, and yeah, yes, the ones in red. Three okay. Vector. Can you? Uh, name, 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 name. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Shell Station. At what location? Uh, uh, well, it's just right north of Highway 32. It's at the intersection of Guilford Road and, uh, and, and, and US 1. Okay. Shell Station, Wall Farm. Uh, uh, BP. This one is right across from me. He said 32. That's in Anne Arundel County. Is that correct? Howard County. Or Howard that's County. Howard County. Thank you. Okay, that's what I meant. Howard. But Thank they you. have identified that as being the trip. The oh, okay, trip. I just want to make sure. So this red one is the wife supermarket. Okay. Right across the street from me. And those are all straight up Route One. Uh, okay. Route One. Carmax is right here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This one is uh, Sam's Club, who sells a ton of gasoline. This one is a little uh, uh, shop that works on cars, and they have uh, gas dispensers. This okay. one. Well, the one with the little shop. Can you give us an ad? The one, yeah, just you know, it's a little base station, as we call it. Okay. And they have Where a, is it located? Well, it's on uh, it's on Highway One Ninety Eight. Okay. All right. Now, I understand they missed this one. Uh, this was a shell station, uh, a base station with four dispensers, and they have torn it down, and they're building a humongous shell station called a dash. Okay. It probably will sell as much gas as uh, as uh, as the wall. That's on 198 before you get to Bond Mill Road. Uh, that, that, that's right. This, uh, this is an Exxon station. It's first intersection after you cross I 95, and then the Shell station is, is right down there. Understandably, they missed that one because there wasn't anything there right now. Now, let, let, let me uh, so, so to kind of summarize you've got 10 stations in the city limits, you got 17 more identified by the needed analysis that's being in the trade area. That's the Greens. And then there are eight more that's in the trade area that they missed, you know, for whatever reason. Now, the demand issue, they also state that uh, uh, the trade area residential area, a demand, I'm sorry, the trade area residential demand is a little over 45 million gallons a year. Okay. Let's, now that's residential. That's only the people who live around here. Mm -hmm. Let's assume that there's twice as many total. We kick in another 55 million gallons sold to the passerby, the buyer people. Okay, so now you've got a hundred million uh, 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 a gallon demand in the borrowed trade area uh, per year. You divide that by 35 gas stations, and you divide that number by uh, 12 months, that means that uh, uh, each station on average will sell 230,000 gallons a month. Can a gas station sell 230,000 gallons a month? Most gas stations are like uh, uh, they have eight, uh, I'm sorry, they have six dispensers, meaning that they can fuel 12 vehicles at the same time. Yes, Mr. Duncan, is Duncan, yeah. is he being offered as an expert? No. Okay. I, I think my 20 some odd years in the gas station business to qualify that means an expert, sir, but, but anyway. I, I don't uh, know if he can speak wait, about... One second. My... Council, can he speak about what can happen in the uh, trade if he's not qualified as an expert? Is if he is opinion? not qualified as an expert, it's his opinion. Okay, so it's just lay opinion. Well, well, but I'm just Correct. Okay. Their okay. I'm just quoting their number. 
Can I ask you a question, Mr. Duncan? If you, you add the eight stations that they did not count in their needs analysis, and you multiply that times the 1.44 million gallons per year that Mr. Cronin estimates each station would sell, what does that do to the unmet demand as he describes it in his report? Not sure. I, I, I well, he said that the, third, the total uh, demand was 38 million gallons. You take eight stations times 1.44 million gallons a year, okay. that would then exceed the 45 million gallons a year, would it not? Yes, it would. Okay. Uh, where is your station on the chart? Would you show us? Uh, I, I have two. I have, okay. uh, I have this one. Then I have one up here, just off I-95 on 216, the other uh, access to uh, the law. Okay, well how many gallons of fuel are you currently selling at those stations? That's what I was going to ask. What's your annual gallon sales at oh, one, okay. one of the stations? Yeah. Let me just, uh, I was about to get to that. Each, each one of these 35 stations has got to sell, 200, sell 230,000 gallons a month. Well. This station only has five dispensers, meaning only ten people can fuel. And about six, seven, eight years ago, I forget now, I wanted to see how much fuel I could sell at that gas station. There was about three months that I sold over 500,000 gallons, five dispensers, meaning people waiting in line, they might have had a few at the rush hour place. So what I'm saying, any, this, any gas station, this, this five or six dispensers, can sell up to a half million gallons of gasoline a month. So, think about 35 times 500,000 gallons. What does that equate to? I don't have my but, sir, here. not all the stations have 12 pumps, do they? No, no. I, I'm saying the average gas station has six dispensers. I only have five, but now, you know, when you say dispensers, you know, you can fuel two cars with one dispenser, one on each side, right. okay? Mine is a little smaller than most, but I can sell 500,000 gallons of gas a month, you know? So times 35, how many gallons is that? If we can sell, and there is no demand for that much gasoline. In terms of percentages, where are you in terms of your capacity? Where, I'm not sure I understand it. Well, uh, right now, uh, it, 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 uh, this one down here, I'm doing about 250,000 gallons on average. So that's about half of what about the capacity is. About half of what my capacity is. And what about the other station? That's right, not down the other station. You know, I'm only doing, I'm at 50% capacity. And, and as is most dealers in the law of freight area, they can sell twice as much as they're selling. If, if there were demand. Pardon? If there were demand for twice as right. much. But see, there's not enough demand. And these people saying there's demand for more gas stations. But there is not any more demand. I mean, we're selling to every customer that drives in, and we are not selling anywhere near our capacity. Are you familiar with any instances where customers have been unable to obtain gasoline at your station? Never. And uh, what, you know, unless the system went down for an hour or something. Or, you know, okay. You know. What about within the city of Laurel? Are you familiar with any instances where customers have been Never. 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 Okay. <laughs> what about within uh, the trade area as it's been defined by the yeah, well, I'm not familiar with all of them, but you know, I've never heard of a gas station, station not being able to meet customer demand. Are you familiar with the phrase gasoline alley? Yes, I am. What is that? Well, it's been about eight, money, isn't it? 18 years ago uh, when I had my station in the city of Laurel, Washington Post wrote an article about uh, Laurel, Maryland, how many gas stations headline was Gasoline Alley. Through the old uh, three-mile radius circle, 
at that time there were about 32 gas stations within that three mile radius area. And, and, and it was quite a superb article, you know, showing that Laurel has got more gas stations per square mile or, or whatever as any place in the world. Well, that's quite true, I think, and if there were 35 stations then and there are only 37 now, that's not too bad of a, a, a well, change. Well, you know, I don't want to really address that. I, I'm not even sure. I believe, as I recall, the number was 32 within the, at that time within the uh, three-mile radius, whereas now <coughs> we've only got 30 in the three-mile three radius, but we got 35 in what they define as the uh, Laurel trade, their term, their definition. Mr. Duncan, are there a sufficient number of gasoline stations available to serve the existing population concentrations in the city of Laurel? There are not only enough to serve the, uh, the, the uh, residential uh, concentration in the Laurel trade area, but anybody else in that <clears throat> you know, a lot of people well, I think that's the whole point, Mr. Duncan, is that over the years, Laurel has become a niche for gas, buying your gas, and that from 1970 or whenever this article was done to date, we still have people coming from all over the place to buy gas at the Exxon station because it's three cents less or what have you. We've never had a lack of people coming to buy gas in Laurel. That's why 35 stations, or 27, have been able to, to sustain. Things are changing in that industry as well, I agree. <clears throat> but I'm not sure if what we are discussing is, is actually uh, pertinent to, it's an opinion, I agree. But I don't know if it's actually pertinent to what's going on at this point. I think probably most of it should have been brought up to the Planning Commission initially prior to their approval. Um, can I say something? Um, in a minute? Not yet? After, when you come to the podium, and, and, and right now we have someone up here. Thank you. Madam Chair, I have no further questions, Mr. Duncan. I do have Mr. Ahmad I'd like to call as a witness. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Mr. Ahmad, would you state your name, please? My first name is Iftikhar. Last name is Ahmad. Address is 825 Goldman Avenue, Lower Maryland, 2077. Is that your business address? That is my business address. And what's the name of your business? Laurel Park Shell. Did you form a corporation to operate that business? Abby Inc. doing business as Laurel Park Shell. That's A-B-Y Inc. A-B-Y Inc. Correct. All right. Uh, and are you appearing here as an individual again on behalf of your corporation? Individual and corporation. And how long have you operated there? Almost 12 years. So you're familiar with the area? Very familiar. Can you show your station on the chart? I'm right here. Where is that? What road is that? <coughs> that is between 7 and 8 steep with the 198 split in the triangle. Okay. Um, how far away from that, uh, from the subject location where the wall is proposed, is that? I think it's less than half a mile. And is your station, That's what's your incorrect. current volume of uh, fuel sales? Around 170. Is your station capable of selling more fuel? I used to do 400. I can show that I could 400,000 gallons. So you're, so you're doing less than half of your capacity right now? Yes, sir. How long has the station been there, sir? I am there for at least 12 years. Right. The station is there for a long time. 30 years right. Long, long time. Years. Long time, very long time. And I have a 6 MPD, sir. Can you and I'm sorry, I didn't hear what you, I didn't understand six. what you said. I have a 6 MPDs, 12 car can pump. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, can you describe a, any trend in the sales of motor fuel over the last three years? Well, wherever we go in the convention, oil company conventions, electric cars are coming, hybrid cars are coming, five gallon mileage is improving. Are supposed to do more, a 
and every year gas volume is going down. Are you familiar with any instances where customer, customers have been unable to obtain fuel at your station? No. Um, what about within the city of Laurel? Not to my knowledge. And what about within a three mile radius to your knowledge? Are there a sufficient number of gasoline stations available to serve the existing population concentrations in the city of Laurel? As the other guy described, I, I did this same survey this morning myself. There is a 35 stations in 10 miles drive. We go on 198, cross parkway to the next station between 32 and 198. If you go this way, cross 95, Station, that stretch and loop one same way. Mm. Uh, for County Road and to uh, Guilford Road, and also Seven Street, which turned into 216 and 197 from uh, 198 and 197 to Parkway. All these are 35 stations. So, is there a sufficient number of gasoline stations available to serve the existing population concentration in the city of Laurel? More than enough. Okay. No further questions of this witness. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Thank you. And I'd like to make a little statement, if I may. Certainly. Good board. Um, respectfully, the applicant has not met its burden of showing by a preponderance of the evidence that the, and this is the standard, the necessity exists for the proposed retail sale of automotive fuel due to an insufficient number of gas stations presently available to serve existing population concentrations in the city. Let's talk a little bit about the needs analysis. Uh, it's based upon statistics. It's not reality. There's no actual data for fuel volume used in that analysis. We have shown that if you add the eight additional stations that are all within the 10 minute drive as shown on the chart, and I'd like to offer that chart as, a, as an exhibit to the board also. Uh, it wipes out entirely this unmet demand as was stated in the need analysis. Um, I would add that the staff report uh, contains no analysis of this issue. It simply references the report and then recites the language in the code. Uh, another problem with the staff report is that the question of whether the proposed use will have adverse effects on the health, safety, or welfare of residents or workers within the area, that's on page three of the staff report, it says that the proposed Wawa station complex does not abut residential or institutional properties. Well, the need analysis on page seven states that to the west, the property adjoins single-family detached residential development in the Irving Street neighborhood. Of course, we heard from some of those residents tonight. So there's obviously an inconsistency here. Uh, so for this reason alone, the application should be denied. Uh, there's nothing in the needs analysis about the projected volume for the Wawa store. These Wawa stations, this is their business model. They sell hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel, over 400. 500,000. Uh, this type of volume is obviously going to have a tremendous impact if, on most, if not all, of the stations that are, that are shown on that chart. Um, it, it's going to have a devastating impact. Um, going back to the statistics, uh, the needs analysis, I alluded to this on cross examination a little bit. Yeah, uh, and it will bring more traffic as well, of course. Uh, the needs analysis provides that the average station pumps 120,000 gallons per month. Uh, in another uh, case, they claimed it was 130,000 per month. If you bump it up to 140 per month, then it wipes out this unmet demand. The point is that you can play around with statistics. You can make the statistics do what you want them to do. But the actual numbers show that these dealers are below their capacity. And I, we can show the fallacy of the, of the data. I have a handout on this that I'd like to submit to the board. Is the price of their fuel any less than the price of the other dealers? The price of whose fuel? I'm sorry. Wawa's fuel? Typically, they are very competitive with their fuel. Of course, we don't have that information now because they have no one. But typically, they are very competitive with their pricing. Um, if I may? Certainly. Now, these are based on what? 
These are based on numbers from their needs analysis. Council. For the needs analysis, the unmet need is 6.5 million gallons per year. And they, uh, if you divide that by 27 stations, that's what they have in the needs analysis. Uh, that we, we say there's 35, but if you divide it by 27, that's 240,000 gallons per year per station. If you divide that by 12, that's 20,000 gallons per month per station. If you divide 30 days in a month, that's 667 gallons per day per station. And assuming the average fill-up is 12 gallons, that's 56 additional customers per day. Divide that by 24 hours, we're talking about 2.3 customers per hour. That's a, a, a demand that these existing stations could easily absorb without even counting these 35 stations. Uh, Mr. Parson, can you provide a copy of this document sure. to council there? Thank you. Again, the standard here is just showing by preponderance of the evidence that they have the burden of proof that the necessity exists for the proposed retail sale of automotive fuel due to an insufficient number of gas stations presently available to serve existing population concentrations in the city. Uh, this is a different standard that was at play, uh, it, well, in the Prince George's County Code. Their standard is necessary to the public in the surrounding area. The city of Laurel has added an additional standard here that it has to, it, there's, an ins, there's a necessity due to an insufficient number of gas stations. That standard is not in the Prince George's County Code. It's not in Montgomery County Code. But then Laurel's right. always been unique with gas stations. So, again, this is a different standard. The reference is to gas stations. It's not to convenience stores. The fact that Wawa may offer some unique product that's great doesn't matter. The standard is gas stations. There's a sufficient number of gas stations, more than enough to serve the needs of the citizens in the community. We've shown this through actual evidence and not based upon statistics. So for all of these reasons, we respectfully request that this application be denied. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Parsons. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Oh, yes, sir. Why don't you come up? Name and address, please, at the podium. My name is Isaac Alal. I own a gas station on Schweitzer Lane, 15151 Schweitzer Lane. The Exxon? Exxon, okay. by UPS. I'm, I'm going to tell you that those people here, they're not that nice people. I lost, I lost more than $300,000 in Orlando, Florida. They came in and they been a mile away from my gas station. And uh, I fought them for one year. And I turned the keys. I couldn't stay in business. And this is their trick. They come in there, they'll, 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 I'm a little bit farther from them right now. Right. But they will kill 10 gas stations all around them. Please deny the application. I lost $300,000 because of those nice people. And, and another thing, is there anything you this, want to say about gentleman, this gentleman over here? He tricked us. We didn't know that we well, were going to come in here. We didn't go to the uh, plan, uh, plan, planning, planning commission, commission meeting because we didn't know it. He made the application behind it's the public back. Record. It's public record. But, no, the man. Is there anything you like to say he about this particular application? application? But he didn't say it's Wawa coming in. What difference would it make? A, a big difference. So it could be another gas station, it might be all right? No, but that's the way, it, that's the way we are here now. Okay. When you're asking why nobody yes, why knew, you, right. why nobody knew, we didn't know about it. Because if we knew about it, we have watchdogs that tell us, gas station's coming up. We're gonna talk about it, we put our- Plan together, etc. 
we didn't have we didn't have a chance at the commission to put the you know, two cents in. Okay. So all right, it was not fair. All right, sir. Thank you. Don't forget your key. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have everyone that wants to speak? Yes, I think. Now, board members, I'm not sure if we need an executive session or what your feeling is on what we should do next or what you suggest. I am prepared to hold it. Are there any questions that need to be addressed that we're comfortable or not comfortable with? I'm prepared to vote. Uh, for the record, could I ask the, uh, the applicants three quick questions? Certainly. Simply to clarify the air. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Uh, for everybody in the room, I think our responsibility is to try to be as neutral as possible. And with that, that means that we also at times have to ask questions uh, to allow both sides on, of an issue to uh, get out uh, the particulars that might clear the air for us. Uh, this is one of those cases. There's a lot of interest here, but we have to make sure that we get it right. And in order to do that, they have uh, the opportunity to also uh, come up very briefly and uh, say some of the things that I did not hear. Uh, we heard a lot on why you, some of you all feel uh, that this should not be done. But I don't think that this board is designed to be uh, in the role of refereeing uh, free open market competition. That's number one. Uh, number two, we have specific marks to be met. And if they meet those marks, that sort of walks us down the road. There's an issue as to whether those marks have been met. But to, I, I just whispered something. I'd say that the sheet that was just last sent actually helps them, too, because you're acknowledging that there could be always more gallons to sell. And there's a niche in there to sell extra gallonage. It's not up to me to referee who sells that gallonage. Uh, but I would uh, also like to ask this with saying that <clears throat> I didn't hear anyone talk about the possibilities of the increase in a good way of traffic because we just opened up Laurel Town Center and that might bring more uh, people in that could buy this this fuel. I, did, I also didn't hear anyone talk about the increase in population, which I'm very proud of in Laurel, uh, going up. Thank you for talk about the uh, housing stock going up and the price of our average median income going up. I do w monitor those. We know about Conterra. We know about other housing uh, areas being built. So I just want to try to get in my mind before we make this decision that I'm getting all, not only the reasons why uh, opposition, but some reasons that maybe you can speak to that went into uh, why this is a need and why we, we might have a station that could at least be available uh, to sell not only more fuel in your con convenience. So very briefly, if you could address those issues, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. It is clear from the folks that have spoken here in opposition that they uh, feel very strongly about the issue and we acknowledge that and we appreciate that talking about competition and people's existing business, so we understand that. But we also think that we have a unique product uh, in the Wawa store that we'd like to offer here for your consideration tonight that is going to be uh, a positive for this community. Uh, we operate very clean stores. Uh, the lighting was one of the issues that was raised before. Um, those are all down lights. We don't have stadium lighting that light up the whole place. Uh, the design of this has been vetted by the staff uh, and we believe that it is most appropriately designed. Uh, but with regard to the, uh, the needs analysis, um, I hate to get too legal technical, but the fact of the matter is that the only expert witness that testified here this evening on the issue of market analysis was Mr. Crone. You are allowed as a body to take into account the demeanor of the witnesses that you see before you, what their biases might be, whether the evidence that's been presented to you uh, contains any bias and determine what you think are the facts and circumstances of the case. When you look at those facts, we would assert respectfully that the expert testimony of Mr. Cronin shows that there is a need that meets not only the statute, but also just the common sense understanding of what need means as well. We have met all the obligations under the code for the special exception test. We have worked on this project for more than two years. This is actually the fifth opportunity for us to do before a body. We started several years ago with communications with the mayor 
and with the other staff members to talk about how we would first go through uh, uh, bringing into the city of Laurel additional properties uh, in the annexation. That was our first step. We've had two other steps uh, subsequent to that that included the, uh, uh, the rezoning of the property that was not rezoned as a part of the annexation as well as other site plan approvals, all of which were approved by the Planning Commission that related to the, the ATM and, and, the, uh, uh, and the plat correction. So this is not something that has been done behind closed doors. There have been multiple public hearings, multiple opportunities for postings and advertisings, and frankly, some of the innuendo that has been suggested that we have not been open and honest about this is, is a little insulting because of all of the outreach that we have done with regard to public hearings and public meetings. I know I'm wandering a little bit and I apologize, but some of it I just felt compelled to, to address. But the staff has indicated clearly that in their opinion we've met all the requirements. This has been vetted at the Planning Commission. They've heard the testimony and the evidence. They believe that it meets all the requirements and we believe that the evidence as presented uh, to you this evening does as well. I think Mr. Glazer wanted to offer a final comment if possible. I, I think I want to get right to the uh, board members' um, comment. I, I think we've spent a lot of time with the retailer and understanding the market. And, you know, Wawa finds this a unique opportunity. Um, they think it's a ideal location for them to service the community appropriately. Um, and clearly it also, the one thing that separates them very differently than a lot of the other operators that have spoken this evening, they don't do any type of servicing or have any service bays, um, which are a large piece of other gas facility components. So it, it's one of those other pieces I just wanted to mention that gives a little bit of a difference from this to some of the other users. So. Thank you. From your expert, uh, again, my, my three things where I want to be clear about is uh, population increase. Uh, traffic density in a good way, meaning more traffic because of the mall. Did you all uh, look at all that? I'm trying to get to uh, oh, okay. the, the yeah. other the other side of this. Yes. Uh, well, so and, please and address. As, as, as Kimco, um, we are clearly operators of retail centers across the country. Um, clearly, this is a center. And as the chairwoman brought up, or I think you brought up, um, previously, you know, with the Laurel Town Center opening, a lot of positive de developments happening along Route 1, uh, Contera happening, you know, all those things and all the activity happening around Laurel um, certainly made this a very interesting opportunity for Wawa to come to. Um, so it wasn't just um, coming here and not seeing any growth, any activity over the last couple of years, but, you know, now that a lot of these developments that really got stalled between 2008, 2010, and 11 the market going down have really started picking up and really adding some real volume to people coming into the area. Is that what you were? Thank you. Okay. Thanks. I'd say in addition, uh, if you look on page eight of my report, it talks about the residential growth uh, within the trade area there. Um, again, I tried to make my analysis uh, as contemporary and as conservative as possible to not, you know, uh, not uh, making estimates based on something that's going to happen five years from now, but based on what reality today seems to be. But in any case, again, the population increases are uh, certainly stated in the report and saying that the area will be growing. Thank you. Mr. Cronin, I just have one question. On the, the Laurel trade area, there you're referring to the 27 stations and they're saying there are 35. Is there some, did you have a different area for the Laurel Trade area or is it just uh, reaching for all the gas stations within a certain distance? Well, without uh, I know. The, the opportunity to look at exactly their locations, et cetera, I'd say um, the reality is that my numbers were based on ESRI, which is a market data and demographic data provider. Um, their map is, you know, uh, in the report uh, as to where the 10-minute, uh, uh, you know, extent of the trade area is. Um, there may be some difference, you know, if somebody drives uh, 10 minutes 
in a certain direction today. It might not exactly match the ESRI uh, trade area. Again, I tried to keep things consistent with the, you know, uh, the data provider that I had. So there may be some differences in, um, you know, uh, the way they would determine that 10 minute drive, uh, for example. Okay. All right. Any other questions of Mr. Cronin? Uh, no, ma'am. Sure. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Was there not a gas station there many, many, yes. many years ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. All right, ladies and gentlemen. If there are no other questions or responses, may I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the uh, findings of fact and conclusion of law as outlined in the technical staff report and a move approval of application. So my motion will be a motion for approval of resolution number 841 for Wawa Gas Station as presented uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the paragraph stating the uh, technical. The state highway. The state highway technical requirements. Need to be met. Also, I'd like to add that the safety of that area really is important because it is a high traffic, high accident area to begin with. People run those lights constantly. Um, I don't know how we could address that, but it is a very, very critical and important thing that we do need to consider. So with that, may I have a, a second? A second. Oh, Madam Chairman. Yes. Uh, the resolution needs to be uh, redone in order to have the uh, evidence and discussion that was presented here tonight. So if you would just move forward on the special exception and we'll have the resolution back to you at a later time. All right, but we still, we need to vote on it, don't we? Yes, yes. we'd be approved. Okay, All right. Madam Chair. Yes. I'm sorry, my button's not working. <laughs> um, what you could do is you could still move to approve with yes. the conditions and direct that the resolution be drafted to reflect your decision. That's what, That's what we were, I thought we were doing. And then that okay. will come back to you at your next meeting. Okay. I want to make sure we take care of those conditions. Right. So with that and the recommendations, we would like to have a motion to approve. I made that motion, Madam Chair. Okay. My motion was to approve with the conditions. Tonight. Okay, with the conditions. Yes. All right, and those conditions in that form is acceptable to you? I think as part of that motion, and I'll look to Sarah for this, but I think part of that motion reflected and approving the resolution, that's the part that we would like to remove because the resolution should be amended to reflect testimony that was provided here tonight. Okay, so this so is what we... Just the top part. Just okay, the then I move that we adopt the findings and facts and conclusion of law as outlined in the technical staff report and move for approval of the application. Now we need a second. It was already seconded previously. Oh, I didn't hear. Okay. I didn't hear you either. <laughs> Mr. Lee? Yes. Mrs. Collins? Yes. Mr. Whitley? I'm going to abstain. Mrs. Lez? I vote yes. Chairwoman Chenault? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. I'm hoping that everybody will be able to benefit in the area. We seem to have done it for a million years, and I don't know if the reduction in gas volume is not because of the type of cars we're all driving now. And you'll all have to get oh, those electric plug-in stations. Are you going to put those in your gas stations at some point? Um, I know I saw them in California. But anyway, so the uh, it's been approved. Thank you all for coming, and have a good evening. Thank you. We have another. Oh, we can't. We can't. We can't have the action on the resolution. No. Right. Okay. So we're going to skip number seven. What time is it? Oh my God. We haven't been here this late. Have, have you ever been here late? We haven't been here until 1131 time. So we'd never do it again. I was on the Ethics Commission a long, long time. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's get on. I'm sorry, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We do have another. Uh, you're welcome. An another application variance to review. So if you could all scoot or quiet, we'll continue. Um, item number eight, 
variance application number 842, McDonald's, 14810 Baltimore Avenue, filed by McDonald's USA, LLC. May I have a reading of the record, please? Yes. Variance application number 842 was filed on January 16, 2015 by McDonald's, USA, LLC, 6903 Rock Ledge Drive Suite, 1100 Bethesda, Maryland, 20817 requesting developmental variances and detailed site and landscape plan approval to demolish the existing McDonald's buildings at 14810 Baltimore Avenue, Laurel, Maryland, 20707, and construct a new fast food restaurant with new parking layout and drive through lanes. The variances are for the front and south side building setbacks and parking and driving aisle setbacks from all parking lines. The property is owned CSH Commercial Shopping Center. Under date of February 6, 2015, a letter asking for comments was sent to the City of Laurel Police Department, Office of the Fire Marshal, Public Works and Parks and Recreation, Maryland Office of Planning, the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission, the State Highway Administration, the Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission, the Prince George's County Health Department, Maryland Department of Planning, Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation, Baltimore Gas and Electric and Verizon. The following responses were received and have been made a part of the official record. Laurel Police Department dated February 10, 2015. Laurel Office of the Fire Marshal February 10, 2015. Laurel Department of Parks and Recreation February 10, 2015. Laurel Department of Public Works February 11, 2015. Maryland State Highway Administration February 23, 2015. Prince George's County Health Department March 3, 2015. No responses were received from other agencies. Under date of February 9, 2015, a letter advising of this public hearing was sent by certified mail to the applicant, the property owner, and all contiguous property owners. All return receipts were received. The file contains a certificate of publication verifying that this application and public hearing was advertised in the March 19, 2015 issue of the Prince George's Sentinel. The file contains an affidavit signed by the applicant attesting that a zoning sign has been placed on the subject property and has remained and shall remain until a decision is reached by the Board of Appeals. A memorandum from the City of Laurel Planning Commission to the Board of Appeals dated March 11, 2015 reads as follows. At the regular meeting of the City of Laurel Planning Commission held on March 10, 2015, the following action was taken on the subject zoning application on a motion by Mr. Wilson, seconded by Mrs. Bettman, carried on a roll call vote by all members present. The Planning Commission recommended that the City of Laurel Board of Appeals grant variance application number 842 with the condition for south exit only on Baltimore Avenue as presented in the technical staff report. The developmental variances are as follows. 21 feet front building setback variance to locate the building 29 feet from the front property line on Baltimore Avenue, 22 feet south side building setback variance to locate the building 28 feet from the south property line, 25 feet parking space and driving aisle front setback variance, 10 feet parking space and driving aisle side yard setback variances, setback variances on the north and south side, 10 feet parking space and driving aisle rear yard setback variance. A favorable recommendation was based on the following. One, the strict application of these regulations would result in unusual practical difficulties on the site. The property boundary is not changing from its recorded date of April 24, 1968 with the Melar Parcel X subdivision. The proposed building is nearly identical to the current building size. The current building side yard setback and the parking and driving aisles do not conform to the Unified Land Development Code. If the proposed building was relocated to meet the front setback, a rear setback variance would be required to conform the code. Second, the variances to allow the proposed development are the minimal and similar to the existing setbacks of the current development except for the building front yard setback. However, if the building was relocated to meet the front yard setback, a building rear yard setback variances would be needed to meet the code. Third, the variances will allow the commercial use of the property to continue as shown in the City of Laurel Comprehensive Land Use Plan. Fourth, the variances will not be detrimental to neighboring properties. The property is surrounded by commercial properties. The variances will promote public safety. The existing parking lot configuration requires vehicles to reverse adjacent to the entrance of Baltimore Avenue. 
The variances will allow the proposed parking layout, which relocates parking spaces further from Baltimore Avenue. The existing parking lot configuration blocks vehicles from entering from the town center and driving in front of the restaurant to access the drive through The variances will allow internal vehicle circulation within the site. The developmental variances with conditions promote public safety for the general welfare. McDonald's at 14810 Baltimore Avenue had 15 accidents from 2013 to 2014. On February 19, 2015, the Transportation and Public Safety Committee recommended a condition requiring south exit only on Baltimore Avenue. That concludes the reading of the file, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would you like to come to the podium? Give us your name and address. Good evening. For the record, Dan Lynch with the law firm of Anthony Hosey with offices in Greenbelt, Maryland. Here on behalf of McDonald's Corporation. Um, McDonald's is going through um, some changes with a lot of its older sites, such as the one located on Baltimore. I'm sorry. Um, I think this is my fifth or sixth site in panel in um, the Prince George's County area. Um, what they're generally doing is reimaging all their properties and updating them. Um, for instance, on this one, we're going to be tearing down the entire uh, building, putting up our new modern uh, McDonald's building, and on every site, we're adding what's called at least a double, a a double drive through. In addition, we're also adding on all these sites what we call a fast forward window, and that's another opportunity to help speed up the drive through service. So, for instance, if you have a special order, such as a special coffee drink, they direct you to move up, not to the first window, not to the second window, but to a third window, where you can wait in line and get your special order drink. That's all part of basically improving service at each and every one of the McDonald's sites in this area. Um, and again, we're just, the, the goal on all these sites is to tear down the existing building, which most of which have been there at least 30, maybe 40 years, because I did have one down in um, University Boulevard that built in 1960. Um, so we're tearing these down, we're reinvesting back in the property. And unfortunately, on every site such as this one, um, we're trying to put a modern building, a modern layout onto a piece of property that was subdivided 30 or 40 years ago. And we're really not subdivided, we're really not large enough to accommodate some of the modern site design requirements, such as some of our current setback requirements, our parking requirements, our landscape manner requirements. So that's why in every site I have handled where we're getting variances or departures or some other special approval like alternative compliance from the landscape manual in Prince George's County. And that's the case that we have here. Um, as Mr. Nemeth indicated in his staff report, and as he indicated to you here today, even the existing building on this site does not meet the setback requirements, whether it be the parking requirements or the building setback requirements. Um, I think with the exception of the front yard setback, but if we try and attempt to meet that setback, then we have a problem with another setback on the site. So if we try to develop this site in conformance with any of the requirements, there's going to be something else that we're going to have to address. So it's almost impossible to bring a modern building on the site without having to get some type of variance from your land use requirement. Um, and then for that reason, I believe that this application meets uh, the requirements set forth for a variance uh, in your um, land use article. And I have with me here today Mr. Jones, um, who's um, kind enough to stick around after his long hearing earlier today. And he will be here if you have any questions specifically with regard to the site plan and the overall layout of the site. Mm -hmm. uh, again, we agree with the staff's recommendation. We have already submitted to staff a revised site plan to address the condition relative to redesigning that. Um, right out only on the Baltimore Avenue, and I'm um, happy to answer any specific questions this board has with regard to this application. Thank you very much. Um, how long will the construction take, the demo and construction? Because that's going to be a mess on US 1. Um, I believe, John, Matthew, have an idea what that is. Actually, Yes, would you give us your name and address for the podium again? Uh, yes, my name is Matt Jones, and I'm with Polar Engineering. Um, located in Bowie, 16701 Melford Boulevard, Suite 310. Thank you, sir. My question was, how long is it going to take to demo the building and put a new one up? Because that's going to be quite messy there on one. Yeah, I guess um, 
first, I guess, uh, with regard to Route 1, uh, any demolition that would occur um, would not be within the state highway, or if it occurs state highway, there would be the appropriate traffic controls to manage that during the demolition process. But with regard to the actual uh, the scrape and rebuild to take the existing building down and build a McDonald's, that's, that's, you're normally looking at you know, probably um, 30 to 60 days of demolition for a site like this take, to take everything down and then to rebuild the stores probably another six months. So uh, I'd say approximately, you know, nine eight, months, eight, eight, eight to 12 months is a normal time frame uh, to complete that type of construction. Okay, thank you. Other questions? No? No questions. And I'd only add that we're really working very, very hard on each and every one of our sites to keep that time frame as short as possible. Because obviously, while the store is down and not operating, we're not generating income up. That's right. So they really That's right. Move this along. And the, the city is going to, you know, have a fit. I think we only have one McDonald's, don't we? Thank God. I mean, you know, <laughs> one's, one's good. One's good. One's good. No, I, I go there too. Um, so if there are no other questions. Well, I, I was oh, curious because you were talking about um, not adequate access, I guess, coming from the back of McDonald's right now. So is that is that going to change? What, what we're really doing here is we're moving the building closer to Route 1 and open up the back of the build that area a lot more so that we're going to maintain the access in our parcel and the town center parcel. When we first came to the city with the proposal, city staff was insistent that we maintain that cross parcel access. So one of the ways of doing it is that moving that building closer to Route 1, thus a necessity of us getting the variance from the front yard setback. And moving it forward is to keep that access open, and I think it's going to be improved over what's out there today. So when you're coming from the back area, if you want it to, because right now you can kind of come in that area and swoop around and get the drive through. Yes. If you're going to have double drive throughs, are you still going to be able to do that, or are you going to have to come in off of Route 1 to be able to go through the drive throughs? I'm not fine. If you're coming off the town center piece? Yeah, if you're coming to the back, mm -hmm. to the back, right now, I mean, sometimes if I go there, I can go and kind of do a little bit of a UV and get to the drive through. If there are going to be dual drive through lanes. Uh, I'll show you on the plan. I think it's easy to explain. Um, the dual drive, here's Route 1. Wow, that is close to Route 1, isn't it? So there won't be any parking? We're getting rid of the parking that's up front. Okay. Okay. And actually, staff likes that because the parking up front will kind of interfere with people coming in and leaving. Right. So move that over here. And what we're doing is moving the building up. We're allowing for you come in, then you have an option to go to either drive through ordering point. Um, and so, what you can do, and then those two ordering points join again to one lane, and there's the payment window here, first pickup windows here, and then the fast forward pickup windows here. Now, if you're coming from the town center to get to this, what you're going to have to do is you're going to go around here, which is on a bypass lane, and loop around again. Oh, so you can drive all the way yeah. around the front. Okay. And, and that's another thing that we feel this is it's much safer about the site, is that movement works much better than what you have out there today. And where were the parking? I was just going to say, where's the parking? Is that the parking? Is here and here. Oh, okay. okay. We're one space over the, um, the city stands. That's and no parking on the other side. No parking on the other side any longer. That's correct. Right? And again, it's all one-way direction traffic. Again, that's a safety issue. The balance insists upon that because again, if you have you know two-way traffic, it's going to interfere with the overall flow on the site. So everything's one way. And that's that dual lane is that a lot of the new McDonald's now, and you find that works that works pretty good, especially going works. down into one lane. With, yeah, it okay, it works much better than anything we've had out there today. Okay. You know, they've been really, really, really refined this since I've been doing this, I think, since 2010, I think. They've refined this, and it's actually improved since I've been doing it. So as they're doing these buildings, they're kind of fine-tuning what they're doing on each and every other side. And then coming out onto Route 1, it's going to be a right turn only, or right you here. have you really can't control that? This plan does not show gonna... it, but what we've done is we have put a directional lane in here. Okay. So that when you come out here, you know, you're, you're, again... We're trying to force people just to go right. Right. We, as we indicate in the prior hearing, can't control everyone, but we think by, by putting a directional lane in, we make it that much more difficult for people to take that, that line. And if they want to go their way, they can go all the way around and go in the back and come out to the shopping right. center and take the light. That's right. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. And one thing to add to that is is that that right out only movement is is going to be designed to the SHA design standards. Uh, so um, and those those standards um, are designed to prevent the left out. Um, and that's going to be part of the, the plan that's going to be submitted to them as part of their access permit review. Well, I think the fact that you can go all the way around is going to be a huge improvement because right now you can't. So and if you want to go left, you're going to take your chances and go out. If you have the opportunity to go all the way around, go back through behind you and then come out through the old shopping center to the traffic light, that's the safest way to do it. And again, by removing those parking spaces up front, right. it allows us to have that lane going away. Right. All the way yeah, I think that's so a great idea. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No? Thank you. Thank you. All right, board members, if there are no other questions, may I have a motion? Yes, Madam Chair. <laughs> no, you are. Go ahead. <laughs> Yes, Madam Chair, I make a motion that we uh, approve uh, resolution number 842. Uh, as presented, or do we approve it with the... I think we have to do uh, the, the motion for approval uh, first. Okay. Uh, yeah, the motion effects. for approval for variance 842, and you can include, if you want to do That's one vote, include resolution number 15-04-BOA. That's where I was going. Uh, so, I make a motion that we approve... Or, 842 and also with the resolution dash I just lost a number 1503 <laughs> 15-04-BOA yes I second okay Mr. Lee yes Mrs. Collins yes Mr. Whitley yes Mrs. Les yes Chair and Chenault yes motion carries gentlemen thank you, thank you good luck thank you. Get it going, the grandkids will be unhappy. Yeah. Couldn't she vote it anyway? No gas pump. I thought that was her handwriting. Please, don't put it in here. Oh, I'm sorry. Although, you look at Janetta. Everybody's got a hitch, and if you don't do it now, customers go away. Now, this is four years, that station has been repaired. Maybe since he put a stack on the page. I mean, you don't know these things. Yeah, you did a good job. But I was trying to. Oh, thank you. I trying to yeah, just roll it back in and just say, look, we got to look at this. So that's what I came to ask. I said, I roll it back in. You did a fabulous job. Uh, 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 that's all. So I was like,